during my presentation, what I thought to show you were some of the molecular mechanisms without going really in detail so that you understand why <coughs> vitamin D has such an effect. And during this presentation, to pick up some of the data that have been presented, some of the new things that came up uh, during this symposium. And I would like to finish with a few data showing why, at least in colorectal cancer, it's so important that we have calcium and vitamin D together. So at the beginning, we had several uh, lectures showing the pleiotropic effect of calcium, although the symposium was on uh, vitamin D and cancer, but vitamin D has really pleiotropic effects. And we had all kinds of very interesting data. Uh, some of them were older or newer. And then we had quite a lot of uh, presentations on the effects of vitamin D in cancer, beginning with the uh, epidemi uh, epidemiological data, then skin cancers, prevention or therapy, P53 tumor suppressor gene, role of vitamin D in prostate cancer, and the angiogenic antimetastatic effects, and so on. But now let's go a little bit more into the molecular mechanisms uh, that can explain all these epidemiological effects that you see. And as I told you at the beginning, I will tell about only vitamin D and at the end about vitamin D. Why is it important vitamin D and calcium? And this is all known by you, that actually vitamin D is not a vitamin. It is the precursor of a very, very potent hormone. And so it can be synthesized in the skin or taken up by diet. And it is really the 125-dehydroxyvitamin D3, the calcitriol, that has all the effects we know. And it was David Feldman, who was uh, at this conference, uh, one of those who had shown that it is the 125 that actually is the active substance. However, if you look at epidemiology, it you can't really find evidence of serum 125 levels and decrease of incidence of cancer. So why is that? And it is the 25D3 le levels that correlate with inverse uh, risk or uh, incidence levels. And that ha you ha all you have heard before was 25D3 levels. So, was David Feldman not right? Is this the really active substance? No. What we realized is that it's not only the kidney that can synthesize the active hormone, but almost every other tissue. Because these tissues have the 1-alpha hydroxylase that transforms the 25-D3 into the active substance. But these also have the 24-hydroxylase, the enzyme that degrades and catabolizes 125-D3. And actually, the locally synthesized 125 the, uh, can, through orthocrine and perocrine actions, have the antiproliferative activity that is so important in cancer. And I'm not going to, on these really pleiotropic effects that vitamin uh, 125D3 bound to its receptor, the vitamin D receptor, which is a transcription factor, has. But I'm going to tell you a little bit more how it regulates cellular proliferation, differentiation, and apoptosis, because these are related mainly with cancer. We have shown several years ago that if we take a colon cancer cell line, these are the KCO2 uh, adenocarcinoma cells, and we have them in a special media that makes them hyperproliferative. And I can tell you the, what makes them hyperproliferative is lack of calcium. So they are 
uh, growing up each other, but if we treat them with 125D3, they began to grow as any decent epi uh, epithelial cell should in a monolayer. And it wasn't only this 125 that could have this effect, but also if we treated these cells with 25D3, we have shown that these have the 1-alpha hydroxylase, so we could have the same effect because they were able to synthesize their own 125D3. And that it is uh, like this, we have uh, shown by an HPLC, so uh, we could, when we treated the cells with 25D3, after a few hours, we extracted the media and the cells, and we could show that they really have 125D3 there, which was produced by these cells. So they can produce their one own 25D3. And you can say, okay, this works because these are cancer cells and they are, it's a cell line, who knows what transformation uh, happened there. But when we um, isolated cells from pro, uh, normal mucosa or from adenomas, and then we measured proliferation rate, <coughs> You can see that in other normal cells, they are hyperproliferative. When we treated these cells with 125D3, we could reduce the proliferation level at the same level as in the normal mucosa. So indeed, 125D3 reduces proliferation. And uh, what I thought, let's compare the characteristics of cancer cells with the effects of vitamin D. You all know, cancer cells, uh, one of the characteristics is independence of external growth signals. They lost sensitivity for growth inhibiting signals, and thus they have unlimited growth potential. What I've so, uh, shown you before was that vitamin D, actually it's 125-dehydroxyvitamin D3, inhibits cell proliferation, enhances cell differentiation. Another characteristic of cancer cells, they are insensitive to apoptosis. So what does vitamin D? Increases apoptosis, activates it. In cancer cells, there is a continuous neoangiogenesis. So what does vitamin D? Surprise, surprise. It inhibits angiogenesis in the tumor, not in the no uh, normal tissue. In cancer cells, there is a tissue invasion and growth in other organs. So what does vitamin D? Decreases metastatic potential. And as we've already heard, it activates the immune system. And the immune system has quite an influence on cancer, uh, on tumorigenesis. So if we want to know what happens and what, what are the players in tumor regenesis, what is important for the vitamin D system? Of course, it is very important that we have enough substrate. And this is why the serum levels of uh, 25D3 are so, so important. But then, it is important that we have the 1-alpha hydroxylase to be able to synthesize the active uh, hormone it is very important to have the receptor to have the action, and we should have as low levels as possible of the 24-hydroxylase because this is the enzyme that catabolizes, that destroys both the active hormone and the precursor. Um, with this slide I, would, uh, slide, I would like to show you some of the, wh why is it important to have vitamin D receptor? These are, uh, is the uh, colon of mice. They are wild type, meaning they have the vitamin D receptor. And we measured the proliferation rate by uh, uh, the expression of proliferative cell nu nuclear antigen. These are these very dark spots. So the lower part of the lower third of the crypt is hyperproliferative, as it should be. And then we have uh, differentiated cells. 
and we looked at the oxidative stress uh, here by uh, eight uh, hydroxydeoxyguanosine uh, expression. What happens if these uh, mice do not have the vitamin D receptor? The proliferation rate is much higher, and they have a much higher oxidative stress. These mice won't get cancer just because they don't have the vitamin D receptor. But if you would challenge them, they have an environment that, we, uh, that would uh, have a beneficial effect for developing cancer. Because higher proliferation rate, higher oxidative stress could lead to cancer. So per se, it won't cause cancer, but it may uh, make it easier to get cancer. Then we thought, OK, if the patients already had cancer, what are the levels of, or of these uh, players in this important play? Vitamin D receptors, so the, uh, these are mRNA levels. They are decreased when we compare normal mucosa with benign lesions and adenocarcinomas. The 1-alpha hydroxylase in this particular uh, study group had uh, intense, so it, it was uh, decreasing, it wasn't statistically significant, but we have shown before that it depends on the grade of the tumor. But the 24 hydroxylase was, had very high levels. So um, if we give these people high, or if they have high vitamin D levels, they might be able to transform it, but they don't have the, uh, enough uh, receptor to get the answer or the response. And most of the levels would be dis uh, destroyed anyway by the 24-hydroxylase. And it is, maybe you can't see so well, but these, these are the um, expression level of the 1-alpha-hydroxylase, the protein level. In the normal mucosa, you, you have very low levels because there, uh, the proliferation is not high. It's how it should be. You don't need anything else to protect you. But in the adenomas and in uh, <coughs> may, um, carcinomas that are still a little bit differentiated, so it's, it's grade 2 or grade 1 uh, carcinomas, you have a hyperproliferative status, so the organism tries to do something against it, and, they tur and it turns on uh, the vitamin D system as a defense system. In grade three, so undifferentiated carcinomas, the expression level both of the vi uh, vitamin D receptor and of the 1-alpha hydroxylase is completely gone. It's not there. So there, it's no point in giving 125. What happens with the 24-hydroxylase? When we looked at the protein expression and compared normal mucosa benign lesions and adenocarcinomas, you can see that about three quarters of the, uh, these were patients, so the normal mucosa, which is not really normal, this is the adjacent part uh, compared with uh, the tumor, but still, three quarters had almost no 24 hydroxylase expression. It was very difficult to see it. And only one third had high expressions, while in the adenocarcinomas, it was the other way around. And here you can see that adenomas ha had, have, had uh, some higher levels, but I love this picture. It was uh, done by Dr. Horvath here where you can see it is on the same uh, slide. Here, you have still the more normal looking like crypts, which has almost no 24-hydroxylase. And this tumor has just huge expression of the 24-hydroxylase. So what would happen if this tumor, uh, this tissue sees 25 these three levels, high 25, these three levels. Here, uh, 
it would synthesize 125 and would uh, stop proliferation. But here, immediately, it would be destroyed. So it's what the point. So that's why for if we want to use vitamin D or 125 and cancer treatment, we have to think about several factors that play a role. First, do we have to use calcitriol and then think about the hypercalcemia? Or can we use colicalciferol, which is the vitamin D, which might not have adverse effects that might uh, so that would be easier to use. Or shall we use calcitriol or analogs? Maybe in cancer we should use analogs that uh, cannot be destroyed as uh, easily by the 24-hydroxylase. There are some analogs that, uh, for which the 24-hydroxylase have lower affinity. Or can we use or shall we use the vitamin D together with uh, uh, other drugs. So there are so many things. And that's why, for me, uh, treatment is, is always a question. And to make it more complicated, I show here a very, a very simplified version <laughs> of how vitamin, uh, vitamin D really, uh, what are the molecular mechanisms. And I don't want to take you to all uh, these things is just things are getting very, very complicated. We know that it's the vitamin D receptor needs the um, hetero uh, to heterodimerize with the RXR or retinoid uh, uh, acid receptor. It binds to the so-called vitamin D responsive elements in the promoter region uh, of the target genes. Then it needs a lot of so-called transcriptional co-activators that then remodel, need to remodel the chromatin so that it can be opened. And then the uh, RNA polymerase can sit there. Or it binds to uh, transcriptional co-repressors because some of the target genes has to be, uh, the uh, transcription has to be stopped. So there is a lot going on there. And if you want to use this for treatment, you have to think of all these. And some of the uh, papers presented in this conference were about these mechanisms. Dr. Aranda said exactly what has been uh, suggested today, that uh, it's not only the vitamin D and vitamin D receptor that play a role in the vitamin D effect but also the, uh, the 9 cis retinoic acid and this hetero, uh, heterodimer. Then in Dr. Muno's group uh, have shown that there exist a lot of repressors for the expression of the vitamin D receptor, such as snail, which has been shown that it is highly expressed in, in uh, several colorectal tumors. And if you have high snail expression, VDR is not there anymore. Then the group of uh, Maury Campbell had shown that there are some uh, co uh, co repressors of the transcription, such as SMART or ANCORE A, that also can be uh, ex uh, higher expressed in tumors. And then it is not enough uh, there, it's not enough uh, 25 or 125 D3 bound to the vitamin D receptor to get this away and make place for the coactivators. And they have shown that in tumors where SMART is highly expressed, the P21, which is a target gene of 125D3, uh, cannot be um, transcribed. The work by Dr. Karlberg makes, for, at least for me, the most uh, makes me more, even more anxious because what he had shown was that so what we thought was that around the, the promoter region is important. We all know now. And we thought promoter region is about 500 uh, bases you know, or nucleotides before transcription. But what he says is that vitamin D responsive elements are found up to 10,000 of nucleotides 
upstream or downstream, even 100,000 upstream of the transcription start site. So how long do I have to look whether there is something changed there to understand why my uh, patient doesn't respond to the vitamin D uh, treatment? Another very interesting thing. Um, I've already told you that vitamin D increases apoptosis, and that is very important also in treatment of cancer. But very often, P53, uh, which is a ma major player for apoptosis, is mutated. And Dr. Rotter has just shown that at least for two of the P53 mutations, the mutated P53 can bind vitamin D receptor, and then instead of increasing apoptosis, it decreases further. So in these cases, in these patients, it's a very bad idea to give 125, because you will have even lower apoptosis levels, so you won't kill your, at least in the cancer, and you won't kill your cancer cells. So the whole thing is very, very complicated. This is just to show you how many aspects one should think if you want to develop a paradigm uh, for uh, 125D3 as an anti-cancer agent. And that's why, for me, vitamin D is a preventive agent. But let's go now to my second part, which will show why we need both vitamin D and calcium. Uh, I liked very much uh, Dr. Lapez's uh, uh, paper, and uh, I have cited very often. But, but uh, this is another, for me, very, very important paper, because not only because it is the first study showing in mice that just by changing the diet, you can cause colorectal cancer. And causing colorectal cancer in mice is not that easy. All the mouse models have more small intestinal uh, tumors and not colorectal tumors. And in these mice, just by giving them the so-called new Western diet or McDonald's diet, that is high fat, low fiber, low vitamin D, low calcium, low methionine, low folate, they induced tumors in one and a half year in the mice colorectal tumors. But if they supplemented the diet, so high fat, low fiber, but they gave high vitamin D and high calcium, they prevented, they, these mice had significantly less colorectal tumors. And they didn't have the same effect just by increasing folate or choline or fiber or whatever. So even with high fat, calcium and vitamin D reduced the number of and the size of the tumors. So this is the list how vitamin D works. What would do here calcium? Calcium has very similar effects. It can de uh, inhibit proliferation. It induces differentiation. It activates apoptosis decreases metastatic potential. It might even act activate the immune system. I'm not familiar, familiar with that. But it has very similar effects. So one would suppose there are synergistic effects. And for this, I would um, like, uh, or I, I've chosen only one pathway, which is the wind pathway. Because the wind pathway is one of the pathways that is uh, mutated in colorectal cancer, very early in the colorectal cancer. The wind pathway is very important for regulating proliferation of uh, colonic cells. And it should, uh, after these cells began to differentiate, the wind pathway should be shut off. However, if it is mutated, for example, APC, the adenomatous polyposis coli gene is uh, Truncated, then it doesn't shut down anymore the wind pathway. However, and during the wind pathway, it is beta catenin that 
uh, binds to the TCF4 transcription factor and will increase the expression of several genes that uh, would lead to proliferation. So what does vitamin D do in the wind pathway? First of all, it increases the expression of beta-catenin and of ecoderin. Ecoderin will sequester beta-catenin in the membrane of the cells where it should be. Then, VDR can bind beta-catenin and thus beta-catenin ca uh, cannot go into the cell nucleus. So it sequesters again here. Then, vitamin D also can increase the um, a synthesis or a transcription of DICOP1, which is an inhibitor of the wind pathway and several other mechanisms. And similarly, does, vitamin, uh, does calcium. It also, by signaling through the calcium sensing receptor, probably, it increases the expression of DICOP1. It increases the expression of another wind uh, molecule that uh, it's inhibitory for this pathway, and that of a ubiquitin ligase that will uh, degrade beta-catenin. So here we have one pathway that can be targeted in the same direct direction, both by vitamin D and calcium. But when we wanted to know what happens, why is uh, how does calcium influence the vitamin D and colon cancer and so on, we have performed a very simple experiment. We took mice and give them a diet that had either high levels of calcium, medium, or very low levels of calcium. Serum calcium levels were not changed. What changed was the calcium in the feces. And for colorect colorectal cancer, it is this calcium that is important. So this would be the, the calcium that is secreted, that we are not interested in, but we should. Because this is the calcium that the uh, crypt cells see. And as you can see, in normal or high calcium, uh, in the high calcium diet, the, only the lower third of the crypt was expressing this proliferation marker. However, if we decreased calcium, we had up to the half or even higher in the crypt, we have proliferative cells. So these cells then can be prone to transformation and then it could, at the end of the day, if we have challenging with some carcinogens, they could lead to cancer. Okay, what happens with the vitamin D system in these mice? Expression of the vitamin D receptor didn't change really. One alpha hydroxylase. So this is the colon, not the kidney. Colon. Uh, one alpha hydroxylase was some change, as uh, we've seen also in the adenoma. So it it seems that it tries to do something against the hyperproliferation, but that was not signi uh, statistically significant. But what happened was that in the low calcium group we had really high levels of the 24 hydroxylase. And only when we had uh, enough or high levels of calcium was the CYP24 down there where we want to have. Meaning, and that was not only on the mRNA but also on the protein level. Meaning that we need to have enough calcium that will keep the 24 hydroxylase low at least in the colon uh, page or, or in, uh, for the colon, and only then, if we give high vitamin D, we have the effect of vitamin D. Because if we don't have, if we have high levels of 24 hydroxylase because of the low calcium intake, vitamin D won't have the same effect. So, with this, I would like to conclude, and um, this is my opinion that vitamin D and calcium are together one team for preventing colorectal cancer. So if the sort of move from the classical view of vitamin D to the modern view is that 25 hydroxy vitamin D is important, not just 125, 
has everyone looked at whether D3 is important? No, it's 24, hy that's the, uh, 24 hydroxylase is the enzyme so that would... Maybe I just remember, so I mean, the, 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 the 25 hydroxy vitamin D is important, not just 125. So the new paradigm is that you need 25 hydroxy vitamin D as the precursor to be locally available. Yeah. That then raises the question, well, has, is anyone looking also at just straight D3? Are we getting local conversion of D3 to 25 hydroxy vitamin D3? Because D3 is a much better signal of sun exposure and recent DNA damage for certain cell types, I mean not for the colon, than 25 hydroxy vitamin D, which basically tells you how much sunlight you had as a signal. It's not really very useful at all. It's just as a precursor. So have you looked at the local conversion of, or is anyone looking at the local conversion of D3 to 25 hydroxy D3? Um, no, we didn't look at the conversion of D3 in 25 D3. But uh, actually, it's, uh, you, if you give D3 to the patients, they uh, could convert almost all of this into 25D. <coughs> but it, there may be issues in terms of, if you want to, say, achieve a certain target 25 hydroxy D level, you can give it once a month, or maybe once a week, or maybe once a day. But your, and your, your, your area under the curve of 25 hydroxy D will be more or less the same after a few months but your area under curve of D3 will be dramatically different. So D3 is important. Um, uh, what do you mean with D3? Well, I just uh, uh, take your supplement. Mm -hmm. If you take a supplement, if you take oral um, D3, you get about a 24 hour, hour half-life of D3 in your blood, and then that's gone. Yes, but it's transformed in 25 D3. Right, right, but then it's gone. And so if what you need it there daily you have to take D3 daily. So we heard yesterday that D3 in um, lactating mothers is the only thing that's transferred to the, um, in, in milk, and that therefore that there's a, a concern that you need to take your D3 supplement daily as a lactating mother to provide a steady dose of D3 to the infant. I can't tell you anything about it because I've never looked at D3 anyway. So I'm just suggesting add D3 yeah. to, your, to your portfolio question. Uh, the problem is, so we are working more so either in, in animals or in, in cell culture, and in cell culture it depends because I don't know whether uh, these cells have the enzymes that would uh, turn the D3 into 25D3. Well, I asked Holly this question a few days ago, and, he, and his lab is looking at the expression of, I forgot the name of the first level That's the... the uh, 25 hydroxylase, that's the CYP27A1 or the other one, which is mainly in the skin. Uh, so some of them you well, he's might. finding quite varied tissue expression, which is also regulated, which raises the question as to whether D3 is also. Yep, it's a good point. Hello, um, I have uh, two questions. I'd be interested to know your uh, view from a molecular level. It seems that uh, vitamin C in cancer cells uh, requires the RXR. A retinoic receptor to affect genetic expression. Yep. So on that basis, does it appear uh, that both are synergistic? Uh, because of course both are found in food. We sometimes hear uh, uh, the possibility that vitamin A might actually be antagonistic of vitamin D. Uh, that was the, also the work of Dr. Um, uh, so I don't remember the name, sorry, uh, that I've shown you. I, I've never worked on, on that subject, but what she said, it's because of these different, so it depends on which vitamin D receptor, uh, vitamin D responsive element do these hetero um, dimers bind. And this is regulated by the concentration of both ligands by the concentrate uh, where in the um, uh, promoter region these are because the different genes have different uh, positions of these vitamin uh, D responsive elements and also on the concentration of uh, different um, coactivators and corepressors and yes in some cases you can have synergistic effects and in some cases you have divergent effects, and it also depends whether in that uh, particular cell type 
your receptor is sitting already <coughs> on the DNA without ligand, or it is in the uh, cytoplasm and only by binding the ligand is translocated into the nucleus. So it depends on the cell and it depends on the tissue. And that's all I can tell you. <laughs> um, next question. I'm intrigued to hear the answer, uh, which is, it's the summer approaching, and uh, I'm in the habit of applying transdermal vitamin A onto my skin. Uh, the logic or belief is that I don't want to inhibit uh, uh, vitamin D production with sunblock, uh, but I know that transdermal vitamin A is incredibly protective against UVA radiation. and is also rapidly destroyed by sunlight. So on a molecular level, does this make sense? Uh, applying vitamin A to effectively boost one's uh, antioxidant protection in the skin, but hopefully not inhibit vitamin D production. What happens in skin cells? I have no idea. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> I think there's a man here who maybe does. I think that's a very interesting idea. I've got some people at the London Hospital who actually have done a lot of this stuff, not with vitamin A, but the, the conversion, so the, their assays might be very useful to, to examine this hypothesis, it's really interesting. Uh, I, I wanted to just co comment in relationship to the, the, the chicken and the egg, which comes first, because if, if I, the inflammatory defect is, is the, the, the first effect, you get bacterial necrosis in inverted commas that causes proliferation, irrespective of the uh, differentiation. But clearly, in vitamin D deficiency, the cells which are produced are, are going to be less differentiated because of the, the differentiation function of vitamin D. And therefore, they are sort of one out of however many mutations you have to get through in order to get the phenotype. But nonetheless, it also demonstrates that if that would be the model, then it's clear that the, the precancers are going to be the best model to be studying vitamin D because you, you're going to have a shorter half-life in terms of the endpoint, but you're going to get, be still in the, that position of, of getting both reduction of inflammation but also improvement of differentiation to get the better benefit. You're, you're completely right. It's very difficult, even if, if we use uh, animals or, or humans, because often what we see, it's one snapshot, what happens now. But I'm convinced that very often this upregulation that one can see is a response from the organism as a defense mechanism. It has been shown by uh, Mark Hew uh, Martin Hewison that, in, for example, in ABD patients, the 1-alpha hydroxylase is very highly expressed. So one said, OK, is it because it's bad or it's because it's good? And then what he has shown was that in mice, um, if uh, uh, the, there is a, a method how you can cause uh, um, an inf uh, inflammation, chronic inflammation by adding DSS in the water. And when he did this in mice, that were, had no 1-alpha hydroxylase had a much more severe phenotype, showing that indeed the upregulation of the vitamin D system is because the, the organisms try to do something against what is happening around. And, and, and of course, the other thing about the colon is that the crypt is a, quite a sort of sea of <coughs> bacteria that, that are important for metabolite pr production, but also, of course, if there were harmful pathogens in sort of equilibrium because of a good innate immune response in the commas, the vitamin D deficiency will en enhance the inflammatory damage as it occurs. Thank you very much for your presentation. I'm, not, I'm quite impressed about the complicated pathways that you presented. But I want to ask something, you might be very simple and less well complicated. 
about what I call the policeman GP53. What in predicting the therapeutic aspects, I'm a pharmacist, that's why I'm very much interested in therapy. Uh, as we always try now to know the vitamin D status of us, of ourselves, is there a way of determining the P53 status of ourselves? So that in case we could predict that this P53, which is a mutant gene, the status is there in somebody, would it be a simple way of avoiding using vitamin D to use that patient for treating cancer once the, P, once the T53 status is known? Yes, it is, and it is done very often that the status of the P53 is uh, looked at before treating patients, and this is where we are going to this uh, personalized medicine. The problem is that it's easy to measure, uh, so you can say P53 mutated or not. However, not all of the mutations are the same, and in some cases you could have it uh, uh, a mutation which would uh, not interfere with the vitamin D system and another would interfere. However, if P53 is mutated, usually you have a problem in destroying the cells by drugs that would cause apoptosis. So do we link the mutant P53, this, uh, I think, uh, a genetic syndrome called lead framenia? Is it something to do with T53? Mutant gene, or is it the same thing? The leap from any syndrome is because uh, so uh, one of the genes we, uh, that characterizes this syndrome is p53, and it's but p53 is one of the genes which is uh, mutated, I think, in more than 60% uh, of all cancers. Thank you so much. Thank you.